All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So, and, and hey, I gave you that presentation. Oh, he's not. He's not looking at me. All right, that's okay. Um, so, just a reminder that I didn't get a time to talk about it much last night. Just showed you the, the video clip. This uh, website will be our podcast, but we're also going to drop a lot of resources in it. So there's going to be a lot of documents that you might use in different phases of church planting. Um, the 27-page re- uh, article that we talked about from Dr. Anthony Wagoner-Smith will be on there. There's handouts for every presentation I ever do. And so everything you've seen will have handouts. This just launched um, the day before yesterday, so it doesn't have all that stuff on it yet. But if you uh, go to planting67.com, Scroll to the bottom and register. As soon as we have everything up and live, we will send it to you. Everything is absolutely free. It doesn't cost anything. All right, so today we're talking about training your team. So um, again, what, uh, what we're trying to do is help people understand that, that there is a foundation to make in planting healthy churches. Anybody can just throw people together and try and, and plant a team, because I know I've done it, without having any background, and sometimes it works. Um, you know, my very first church plant, I had no idea what I, did, what I was doing. In fact, back in those days, there wasn't even, church planting wasn't common in, in churches. You didn't hear the words, church planting. And so uh, we started a church, I used the book of a book evangelism for the team meetings because I didn't know what else to do. There was not a lot of books out there, and and certainly no YouTube existed back then. Um, this was back in '97 when I was doing my first church plant. But we launched. We had a hundred people on uh, our grand opening, and they owned their own building. They bought a they bought an elementary school that was closing. They refurbished it. They have their own building. It's, it's, a, it's a church there today. So sometimes you will be able to plant something that's help, that, that works out. Um, but if you're not intentional, the odds are drastically lower that it will be a healthy, reproducing church. That church has never planted a church, which is a shame, because that's what we want to do is help this continue to grow. Um, that church is not, not huge in outreach, it's not doing a ton of things to serve its community. Um, so we want to make sure that we're training our team. So I'm, I'm going to give you a really quick uh, just rundown of the principles we use again. First thing, know your community. Know who you're planting with. Know their needs and be able to de- develop a church that's going to meet their needs. Next, make sure you know how to build disciples. Have a pathway of discipleship where you both define what a disciple is Um, Determine what the pathway will look like and then be able to measure your success so you know if you're being successful or not. And then then you start developing this team. Of course, uh, you want to have a proposal created like uh, uh, Pastor Tim said. By the way, I got to tell you, Pastor Tim's proposal is the best you will find. It is the best you will find. And he didn't tell you how much money he's raised because it will discourage you (laughs) Uh, because it was a lot of money Uh, but we really don't need a lot of money to plant churches actually Uh, but using that proposal very very useful so when you start bringing in the team we've had people talk to you about recruiting and making sure that you're very careful about vetting people so that you're getting the right people in your team but now you have a team what do you do with them what do you do with them How do you train your team? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And if you want to plant a church that's making disciples, isn't that what Jesus said, right? Make disciples of all nations. If you want to have a church that's making disciples, you better have a team of disciples who can make disciples. And that's not how core teams come about. You don't just go in and say, I'm going to start a church, develop a core team, and they're all disciple makers. I mean, I've never seen that happen. And so you've got to make that happen. Remember what Jesus said, right? Jesus said, 
go find disciples. Is that what he said? No? Go hope for disciples. What did he say? What did he say? Go make disciples. We are called to make disciples. So the best time to start making a disciple disciples is before your church ever launches. Because if you have that from the very beginning, then it becomes part of the DNA of the church, and it becomes a natural part of the church once you have services. So the training is disciple-making. It's something that you have to do. So you want to be planting these kind of churches. You've got to have that process. So here's the things that I do. I have a weekly training, and... Um, what I do is I make sure, like Dustin, Dustin was just talking about this. You've got to have people who are committed to this. And so when we're doing the interviews, I'm telling them that we're going to have this weekly training. And if, if they commit to this, they have to be at this training. And our training basically looks like this. We have a potluck dinner. You can change the times based on your region. But you have to, I have a potluck dinner. Everybody brings in um, something simple. We just have a quick meal, last 30 minutes. And then from 7 to 8.30, we begin our child care. So we, have, we have, might have core team members that have kids. We always have child care at every one of our meetings. Um, you can do it however you want. If you have money to pay for the child care, you can do that. Or you can have the core team members who have kids, you know, each pitch in to pay for that, um, however it works. Child care, they can watch VeggieTales. They can do little stories, whatever. It doesn't have to be elaborate, uh, but make sure you do the shield, the vulnerable check on everybody who does your child care before they do it. Um, then we do, at the same time, for an hour and a half, we have training. Again, we do this every single week, and I cover six areas. Now, some people want to do one area at night. That's fine. But I cover all six of these areas every single week. I think it breaks up the class, the time, because an hour and a half is a pretty long time to train. And if you're just doing one thing, people start wandering. But if you're breaking it up 10 minutes here, 15 minutes here, 5 minutes there, it really helps the time go uh, faster and you can focus on the important things. So, first thing, discipleship development. Every single week we talk about this. Now remember, I have already developed a discipleship pathway. I define what a disciple is. You know, they're mission-minded. They want to grow. They, they uh, embrace community and the different aspects of that. And so we're breaking this down every week, a little piece of that. What does it look like to be that kind of disciple? Um, so we're talking about that and we're developing disciples so that when we launch, we have disciples ready to um, bring in this community and disciple them as they come in. Um, the next thing is growing together spiritually. Um, I can't remember if it was Tim or, or I think it was Tim that was mentioning this, but we use the book I'm Experiencing God, but not the book. It's the workbook by Henry Blackaby. And I love this book to help form a spiritual community. Um, if you don't create this community um, and, and that they understand what it means to be part of a spiritual community, then when you launch and you're bringing new people in, they're not entering a spiritual community. They're entering a bunch of individuals who have a relationship with Christ, but it's not actually a body of Christ. So this helps actually create the body, the bondage. You know, it's like the ligaments that are holding the arms and the shoulders and everything together. You've got to have that spiritual connection um, it's very, very important. Um, oh, and another thing, by the way, on that one, is one of the reasons I like the workbook is because we hold people accountable. I, I loved, I think it was you were just mentioning about holding people to a higher standard. And we hold people accountable in our court team. And everybody agrees that we are going to look at your book um, and we're going to see who's doing it and who's not. And if you're not doing it, you know, we'll be nice, but we're going to hold people accountable uh, because we want to see this thing happen. We're taking it very seriously. Um, next thing is leadership training. This, for me, is huge. Um, and this is not just training people how to be a leader in the church. 
This is training people how to be leaders in the world, at their work, at their home, in their neighborhood, at the church, at their school, wherever they are, how to grow and learn how to lead in this world. Because I believe that that's what Jesus did with his disciples. He didn't just create people who knew things. They knew how to do, do things. They knew how to make things happen, how to, to lead a movement, an expansion. And if we don't treat, teach people how to lead, we are, we are not providing the service that we need for those people. I'm going to give you an example from my own life because this changed who I am. When I was in my mid-teens, um, my mom uh, took me to an evangelistic series uh, by these weird people who went to church on Saturday and didn't eat pork. Um, and I was really enthralled that they were like using this Bible to explain the Bible. And I got very excited and I said, I want to be part of them. Um, so I joined them and I was blessed to be in a church that invested in their youth. And they in immediately <clears throat> began to put me in positions that I had never been in before. Um, they, they made me an assistant leader for Pathfinders. I really thought that meant we were going in the woods to look for paths. I didn't know what a Pathfinder was. I'd never heard of Adventists, but uh, so I was part of Pathfinders. They uh, like put me in charge of, like we, there's a big camperies were going on, um, and they said, you're going to be in charge of like this drill thing. And I was like, a drill? Like drilling wood or what is this thing? But it's, you know, you know like, like do marching in formations and stuff. And I had never done that stuff. So I'm mathematical. So I drew out all this stuff, like how many people do we have? And I came up with all these crazy moves and designs. And I showed them my plan. And they're like, what in the world is that? But they didn't discourage me. And so we were doing crazy stuff in symmetries and, and shapes and stuff. And we got first place, you know, because they had it. They, I mean, that's first place in drilling is, yeah, well, I guess. I'm not sure if that's applause worthy, but <laughs> anyway, but they let me do that. Then they, you know, they, they helped me start helping lead in during the young adult worship or I mean the youth worship. And they were just lots of stuff. I was in a youth choir. Um, and my parents, my brother, none of them wanted to go to this church. And, and so I was riding my bicycle from our house, which was 10 miles away. And, and I was riding it to the church and back, so 20, minute, 20 miles round trip. And I was doing this five or six days a week because they had us so invested in that church. Um, it was just absolutely amazing. Then they made me a deacon when I was 15. And, it was a, and so they just put me on the rotation like all the other deacons. And so when it was my week, there was a kind of a close, and then the next week you'd open. They'd hand me the keys during the church service and say, it's your week to close. Everybody would leave, and this 15-year-old would go check all the windows, make sure they're locked, you know, turn down the heater, turn off all the lights lock the doors, make sure everything's secure, then ride my bicycle home. And this was in Colorado um, and, you know, Denver area. And if it was snowing the next week, I was riding my bike through a blizzard 10 miles so I could be there first and unlock the doors, turn on the heat, make sure the whole place was warm, you know, get everything, the lights on, the rooms unlocked, and doing all that stuff. And they didn't give, let me give excuses. I'm just a kid on a bike. They expected if I had the keys, I was going to be there first. And, and all of these things, they were teaching me how to, to, to teach. I taught in adult Sabbath school and kids Sabbath school. We did, we did uh, training where we did, or uh, like um, little skits that we went to prisons and did things for prisoners. And, and lo and behold, you would be surprised how that thing can change you. Because when I hit 20, my, my uh, fiance at the time, um, her parents sent her to Walla Walla to get her away from me. Um, and because they were very wealthy and I was poor, um, and they didn't really, you know, there were some things about me that they didn't really care for. 
And so they sent her to Walla Walla, but I followed her. I, could, I tried to get into the school, but I didn't have any money. They wouldn't let me in. So I got a job at Pizza Hut so I could afford my first cheap apartment. And this Pizza Hut job was part-time cook. And I remember the first day they taught me how to cook pizza. Really tough, you know, sauce, cheese, toppings. Um, and the, the, the owner, or not the owner, the manager said, um, listen, we have a meeting, but if, if things get slow, I want you to clean up everything. You know, just do some cleaning if it gets slow. And we'll be done in about an hour, an hour and a half. And so she comes out after the meeting and she goes, what happened? And I thought, oh man, I blew it my first day. I was like, I'm sorry, what did I do? What's wrong? She goes, the kitchen. And I'm looking like, what happened? What's wrong? She goes, I've never seen it this clean. And she goes, what did you do? And I said, well, did you tell me to clean it? You know, and so I just assume if somebody tells you to do something, you do it. So I'd clean the make table, clean the ovens, clean the walls, clean the floors, you know, and I just did it when it was slow. And for some reason in her mind, that meant I'd be a good manager. Um, I don't know. It's fast food. What do you say? Um, <clears throat> kind of fast food. And, and so she decided to make me, you know, if you've ever been in fast food, you know what a shift manager is, right? It's like the lowest level manager you can be. And so she wanted me to be a shift manager. Well, this company owned a lot of different pizza huts. And so they brought all of us new shift managers in to do training. There was about 50 of us in a room. And they, they had this thing. They said, we're going to decide, uh, or we're going to have a, an award on the most, the, 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 the shift manager that shows the most promise. And you as the group, are going to vote on him or her. And everybody said at the same time, Garth. Well, that was the name of my best buddy that was coming from the same area as I was coming from. Garth was six foot seven, absolutely hilarious. Could be a stand-up comic. Um, very fun-loving, infectious personality. Everybody loved Garth. So they immediately assumed Garth was going to win, and something triggered right then. I don't know. I never was that competitive, but something triggered. And I said in my mind, I said, I am going to win that award. And so we had this three days of training, kind of like we're doing here, um, but there was a lot of questions, and you had to do little presentations and do a lot of writing and a lot of stuff. And pretty soon they picked five group leaders that were ahead, 10 people each. I was one of the leaders. Garth was one of the leaders. Um, and one of the things that, that us presentation leaders had, to, or, or group leaders had to do, is we had to do a presentation. And it was on, I mean, a powerful topic, a powerful topic. We had to teach uh, or speak on why is it important to make pizza? A really good topic. <laughs> now, I'm not, I'm not joking you. This is real. This is what really happened. When I did my presentation, there were people crying during it. <laughs> and not, not laughter, but it was really emotionally crying. <laughs> and the reason why is I, I just, I was taught how to talk right. and, and to speak and to touch people. And, and I started talking about how what we do can, can make the difference in families' lives. You know, that the mom's busy. It's hard to say this with a straight face. Cause, <laughs> but, you know, the moms are having to work now. Dads are at work. Kids are do, having to do homework. They just, the families have been just stretched so thin and disconnected. And... and they look for a, a beam of hope in their lives when they, when they walk in the door of your restaurant. And, and so, I, you know, I played it on pretty thick. Um, but when they voted, I won. I won. I was like, yeah, I won. And, yeah, yeah, no, that's not a big deal either. But the thing, that, the thing for the story is this. Then the owner, who was at these meetings, um, my wife, who was still my fiancé at the time, um, came to pick me up because it was in a different city. 
and she had been there a little early. He went out in the hall, and he started quizzing her, like, who is this guy? How can a guy who's 20 years old, I think maybe I was 20 or just turned 21 around then, how can he lead like this? And she said, he learned it from his church. Powerful testimony for a guy who had had no church background, you know, for him. Um, when we invest in our people, it, it, changes, it changes their lives. It changes also how they can impact others. It gives them skills and tools so that, that they can make a difference in people's lives and be influencers. You know, the funny thing about that job is, is he immediately started promoting me, the owner did, and, you know, by the time I started, within 11 months, I was running my own restaurant. It was the fourth largest restaurant that they'd owned in the franchise. Uh, with that first year, we became the, the largest, and we had the fastest growth of any pizza hut in the entire nation my first year as a manager. Um, and all of this because I was prepared. None of the other 50 people had the preparation that I had in that room. If they had, they might have won the, the thing and whatever. But none of them had been prepared like I had been prepared. It made all the difference. And then they made me the regional manager. I had 1,000 employees underneath me, and I was 23 years old. And they also made me the Pizza Hut planter. We didn't call it that, <laughs> but that's what I was. I'd studied demographics of the area, learn about the economics of the area, and see where, where the best places to locate new pizza huts. I'd go in, buy land, I'd oversee buildings, I'd create the best team possible and build up a new restaurant that made a huge splash in the community from day one. That now, so God knows what He's doing, right? He He was preparing me to do what I'm doing today. So you got to you got to prepare your people, help them become disciples, become a spiritual body, learn how to lead. Um, also, how do you impact the community? I train my people. What does it mean to serve people? Uh, um, Pastor Tim is excellent at this. He is way better at this than I am about how you actually interact in the community, invest in people's lives. But we have a process where we do eight different things. Uh, it's kind of a circle. We do a circle of eight different things, of ways that we're going to work in the community. And we do that eight different things three times a year. It's our cycle of evangelism. But it's not an evangelism thing where we're bringing people in. It's, bring, it's where we're going out. And we're training people and we're developing teams where they lead each of these different things. Um, so treat, treat, teach your core team how to do that. Also, how do you run vital ministries? Um, one of the reasons that I got promoted in the Pizza Huts, the fast, you know, 23 years old, I was running. I had 40-year-olds who were store managers that answered to me. Um, is because... When I very first became a manager, one of the regional managers said, the key to success is this. Train everybody to do what you do. Train them to do it all. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, you'll see what happens. And I took him seriously. And so my dishwashers were learning how to write schedules. My, my cooks learned how to wait tables. Everybody learned how to do everything in that store. And pretty soon, it didn't take but less than two years, almost half of the restaurants in the region were ran by people I had personally trained. And so, like, we got to promote this guy. He's training everybody to become the managers. Uh, and so that's exactly what I do in the church, though. I train everybody. Even if they're never going to be a greeter, they're going to know how greeting works. Even if they're never going to be a Sabbath school teacher, they're going to understand why we do what we do. And our ministries are not low-level training. It is a tense level training. Like for our, I'll just give you an example for our greeting. The goal for our greeters is much higher than anything you've ever heard in church before. 
Our greeters are trained with this in mind, that when a new person walks in the door, within 10 minutes, they'll never want to go to another church. And we work toward that goal, not just to say, hi, here's a bulletin. Our children's Sabbath school leaders, they're trained with this in mind. Your kids will love your class and you so much that they will literally drag their parents out of bed and force them to take them to Sabbath school. And we've had many stories of that exact thing happening. This is something when you have, when you do things, what you're saying about excellence and, and you've been presented, when you do things at this level, and you create this as the DNA of your church, then you're multiplying not just churches, but you're creating a movement of excellence that, that's showing God in the light that he should be shown. And then finally, I explain every single step of the church plant. I want people to understand how does this work. I want, I want my people to know why I'm doing this right now. And everything that I'm training you is like nothing compared to what my church plants get. They get the most intense church planting training you can possibly get. And so when they're done, when, they, when they're completed um, going through this, this six to nine months, however long it takes us to do this training, because we want them to be strong disciples, they are ready to plant churches as well. And they know how to do it in extremely well, and many of them have done just that, gone on and planted churches. And so all of this is reproducing yourself. And you want to keep growing in the process too so that what you're reproducing becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. That's one of the reasons that, that uh, we're doing the podcast. One of the reasons that we do boot camp. One of the reasons that we do acts. One of the reasons that we do seeds. We want to invest in our people so that they can grow and in turn, they will invest others so they will grow, and this movement will be an overwhelming force. That's exactly what we need. And so basically, all you're doing is creating disciples ready to disciple others. And when that door opens, that first Sabbath, and new people begin to come in, you're not going to be doing it all. You will be able to accept a hundred new people and be confident that those people will be discipled by the people that you have in your core team. It's very critical to do this right. And so the training portion, which is rarely done if it, at all, if, but usually if it's done, it's really a minor amount, has got to be a lot, a lot more intentional. We have got to step up our game. We have got to do this right. Then you will be planting amazing churches with amazing DNA, and again, those people will be planting churches in the future too. All right, any questions? Do you still make good pizza? <laughs> pineapple or no pineapple? Oh, absolutely no pineapple. pineapple. Yeah. Who says no pineapple? Where are my people? Yeah. Oh my goodness, I'm dividing the audience again. <laughs> I am, I guess. We, I had, a hand was over. Oh, right here. Hey, I ran Pizza Hut's. I know pineapple has got to be on pizza. <laughs> no pineapple. So I just wanted to ask if you could repeat, is it Experiencing God Workbook? Is yes. that what it is? Yes. Oh. Henry Blackaby. Experiencing God Workbook. Has anybody yet? I, I did it last night. How many of you registered yet for gone to the Ask at Planting 67. Anybody here registered? Well, that's Ask at Planting 67 oh. is where you can ask us questions. And oh, okay, us. that's right. But just planting67.com is to register, yeah. So I, Tim, pass, you raise your hand, so we've got some yeah. more hands, so I mean, be you don't sure. Have to be register, sure. it's just if you want. I, I want to promote it. It's just a tool. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? For, uh, it sounds like just about being very intentional. Yeah, it's very, very... You don't nice. shoot from the hip. You have a plan. You're focused. Yeah. Excellence. Right behind oh, you there. Right here. Who, de who develops... A uh, question. Who develops the curriculum for the training? Or do you guys already have, like, a guideline of, of... That's a very good question. Usually I put this in the presentation. 
Um, I do these outlines because I have a business background. Over here was another question. Um, um, but um, because I have a background in development in business, so I knew what I was supposed to do to develop. But if you don't know how to do these things, there's so many resources. You don't have to know how to do all these things. There are books. There are articles. There's YouTube videos. There's so much stuff that will teach you how to do all of these things. Or often in your core team, there's somebody that knows these things better than you. Have them train the other core team members. So, um, but the key is I just go through those six things. Um, you know, those are the six things I do. You've got to decide what's really, really important to you. You, you, might, you might drop one of those things or add an eighth, seventh, eighth, and ninth thing. Who knows? Uh, but those are the things that I found that if you have done these really well, then you're going to have a church of excellence. Um, I, was, uh, I thought that what you said about um, teaching other people to do your job is like the most important thing. Um, that's not, that's something that I, as a leader, ministry leader, have always struggled to do. Um, most of the time it's because I always am like, man, like I can't, I can't see anybody who seems like they're able to, to do or willing to do what I, I want. Like, you know, even, even maybe not take over the whole thing, but it, it, someone who's consistent enough to, to be able to do that. Um, is there like, a, you know, a recommendation, like maybe just trying to like, push people more or like what 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 do you have like a recommendation all for right that? I'm, I'm gonna try and answer this question as fast <laughs> as i can because that is a lengthy answer um so there is actually a process that i use to help people with that first every time you um take on a ministry um, you create the job description yourself and we have training on how to create a job job description but the number one thing in every job description is train somebody to do what I'm doing. Um, two, we do what's called a fractal system of team ministry, where we take every single ministry and we break it into pieces. Um, so that's what a fractal is, anything that's a whole and divided into pieces. Um, and so what we do is, let's, let's give you an example so it's easier. Let's say you are the, in charge of technology. Um, then you're going to break that down into the pieces of technology. So Maybe there is sound, there is lighting, there is video, there's online, whatever. However you want to break it down as the leader. Then you find people to do just one of those things. And you train people in those individual areas. And as they grasp that skill and master that skill, then they can start working in another area in another area. Too often we try and give them everything at once. If you give them a small piece of it, it's a lot easier to find people to do the one little thing. And if you find that they're not able to go beyond that area, well, you've got somebody to do that one little thing. Um, but often you'll find people, as you invest in them, they will be able to master more of those things, and pretty soon you're redundant now. There's two of you who can do it all, and you can grow and move to something different and give it to them. Or when you're planting, they can go or you can go as the person doing that, that uh, ministry in the new church.